body and you'll be good to go. So I mean, like in that case, I guess I'd be dead because I didn't vote for president, but I tried my hardest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I got my Jack Black. Oh, come so on. Oh. I got three of the like January. Okay. I don't know where the faculty is. You and I are here. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to David teaches this class by himself. <laughs> what could go wrong? Isn't In order to avoid. Airplane? That. What? Isn't McKnight getting on an airplane? United. I hope so. <laughs> Getting it's, on or being dragged off? I don't know. Because if it's United, he, he might be back. He wants to picture saying that he, like, on Facebook, he's going to some convention to talk about Star Trek online. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What a job. <laughs> Hopefully you remember to download the exams. He gets a complimentary bodyguard set when he goes off the plane. <laughs> oh. Free of charge. <laughs> so do you think he remembered to download Star the exams? Star Wars Celebration. So, all right, nobody else is on Discord. on Discord, so it's just us. So instead of me teaching, we decided to bring in Professor, Doctor, and you, Eva. Professor, Doctor, <laughs> <laughs> Glenn Mitchell, retired Colonel in the U.S. Army, and I'll turn it over to you from there. Thanks, David. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a title. It's okay. I want the trail like that, that, that. <laughs> ta, ta, ta. Most of you guys know that I'm, I, I'm the relatively new, uh, new faculty hired in September to start the program in healthcare informatics. That's sort of expanding HU in the direction of medicine. Nursing schools, all sorts of other health related stuff. So it was good, except I started my life as an engineer. Uh, I have a graduate degree in engineering. And, and I decided I wanted steady work, so I went into medicine instead. So, because engineering gets laid off. In medicine, when things are bad, patients can always bring me a chicken. <laughs> I can always eat. I could start death as an engineer. <laughs> you got to, you got to make your choices. I really, uh, I enjoyed sort of uh, overhearing you guys <coughs> dealing with the uh, dealing with the sim session, and I thought that's neat because that's a lot of the way the military trains as well. It's very, you know, just off the somewhere. Uh, and what I thought was I would tell you about a, a very similar situation that actually happened and how things go badly when you're trying to make a plan work. Uh, and, and you gotta be pretty nimble when you do it. So I wanna talk about it. I, f I am very happy to be interrupted. I have no weapons with me. Uh -huh. yeah. And I, I, I just interrupted. be happy to be, happy to be interrupted. Uh, this was really a very interesting thing because it was kept very quiet at the time. This was the largest toxicological disaster in this hemisphere ever. It happened in late 1999. Uh, and it didn't get much press because of the politics involved in international relations. You guys are beginning to understand international relations and the negotiations that were taking place trying to get some things done to protect people rather than governments and people in power. So I guess it's sort of relevant to what you guys were doing. It's kind of neat. So I would like to talk about it. Part of what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna frame it for you, and then I'm gonna give you the brief I, I gave to senior military folks at the Pentagon, because I was the doctor. In my role as a physician, I was the doctor in charge of U.S. military interactions from Mexico to the South Pole. So this whole part of the hemisphere, except for the U.S. and Canada. Uh, so I did that for two years, and this happened on my watch. I had already taken care of what was going on after what you guys won't remember, as Hurricane Mitch 
which was the year before, which was the largest hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico in a century, that parked itself over Central America and destroyed Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. And we, I had just finished up, we had seen 250,000 patients, all of whom were homeless uh, after that hurricane. And that was, a, I, I thought I was going to coast for the rest of my assignment and then this happened. So uh, I'll tell you about it. What I want to talk about is just, just to make sure you understand, simple humanitarian mission shouldn't be you know, shouldn't be high risk, should be just about helping people. And so a plan was really very, very straightforward, very simple when you went in. Uh, and I want to discuss a little bit about the unusual ops and, and what you do. And I think I heard a lot of similar things, not precisely this, but a lot of similar things in your thinking when I dropped in on you the other day. So I think this, will, this should resonate with you. So in the summer, Venezuela had, had a lot of rain in, in 99. They had some flooding, especially northern and around Caracas. Uh, Chavez, who is not a great friend of the United States, um, he's dead and he, he hopefully will remain that way. <laughs> I, he really was, as a dictator of the country and not wild about taking care of everybody, uh, he declared that the danger period of flooding was over in the fall. And December had inches of rain each day uh, for a period of a couple of weeks. Uh, and the mountainsides north of Caracas had extensive um, slums uh, built on them with no basements, no anchoring, just into clay on the surface of a mountain, almost at the angle of repose if you ever took a geology course yet meaning things are ready to slide off. And as water gets under clay, it's really very interesting to watch that stuff slide. Uh, and there were mudslides that at early, uh, early estimates couldn't figure out how much loss of life there might be because nobody was making good guesses as to how many people were living in the areas affected. But it was a, a huge area the size of Dauphin County that was just wiped out by mudslides. Uh, so we came in as one of the nations offering aid to Venezuela in the event of this huge catastrophe. So they lost all their roads, all their combo, all their everything, all their water plants, all their electricity plants. Everything had gone in, in part of the country. So part of my job was getting U.S. military stuff down to help them. So, yeah. So. On the, the previous slide, you said the U.S. offered aid, mm -hmm. and and Ugo said yes. Okay, Ugo. Well, he suckered us in by saying yes. Uh, welcome to come down, and we were sending initially some medical folks, uh, and he uh, had us land at the at the Caracas airport, and um, as you'll find out subsequently, never let us leave. <laughs> never let us leave the airport area. But it was really very interesting. Uh, so we got we got down there, suckered into someone we knew didn't like us, but we thought we were doing something nice. So are you like bilingual, dealing with? Say, say, say. Yeah, I'm not bilingual. I'm <laughs> quadrilingual, but that's beside. <laughs> you, have, you have to speak a number of languages. I've been in 62 countries in my entire career. So I have to learn. I lived in the Middle East for four years. Each place. So it's fun. I did not speak Spanish before I took this job. I was supposed to be the surgeon for the Middle East. Um, and a guy who was in front of me with that job, a good friend, like in the, I stayed on for a year because the general liked him. And he liked the general who was working for, star general he was working for. And so I had no job and they offered me this job because the predecessor had been fired. Which is one of those things where you either do really well or you're uh, I pointed out that I didn't speak Spanish. So I spoke, I speak German and I speak Arabic. And I said, I don't speak Spanish. And, and the reply of the personnel assigning guys in Washington was, you will. 
So they threw me into uh, Costa Rica for two weeks, and I would get no food, no laundry, no anything without speaking Spanish. They would, they, the staff would not recognize English in any way, shape, or form. So you either learn Spanish or die. Or you were really, really <laughs> <laughs> So it was very effective. The three weeks after I took that job, speaking no Spanish, I was in Lima, Peru at a public health meeting with no translation. <laughs> Did you do well in that? Yeah, I wasn't. I, four weeks later, I was actually giving speeches. Spanish, I was talking to Spanish. So it was kind of neat. Uh, I haven't kept it up, so I'm not nearly as good as I was. But here I have. We, we really, this was kind of fun. We we had lots of folks coming down with, that's the, you know, the Agency for International Development and State, and a lot of non-governmental organizations uh, were flowing in to, to give aid uh, as well. And we needed crisis action plans for the, for the effort to be able to do it. And medical is part of those crisis action plans. That was my office's responsibility. Okay. So this is what I gave to these four-star generals as the brief for what we wanted to do medically. This is exactly, this is, these are the slides. So you're seeing what, you're, you're actually seeing what Bill Clinton saw. This was, this, but in the background, you see some interesting stuff. In, in that background is the area north of Caracas, and those are the mountains in which the sides fell off the mountains. But that's mud everywhere, that brown stuff. It's just mud. So there's always a situation that you come up and This was a situation about just that heavy rain, landslides, overflowing rivers, just, just to give the folks an idea of what happened. By that time, by the time I got to brief this, which was uh, Christmas Day, when I got to brief this, there were an estimated 30,000 people buried in the mud. They were never recovered. They're still there. Uh, about 15,000 injured and out of the mud, and over 150,000 people homeless north of Caracas. Uh, just kind of interesting, that's more than twice the United States losses in the Korean War that they lost in a matter of hours. In a month's life. So it was a huge disaster. All these pictures I took, and when I went down here, you'll see when I went down here. So it, it was, it, it, I had no experience dealing with this stuff, and everything was disrupted. Like, there were no roads. The roads were covered with mud. So it was dependent on helicopters. He had Russian helicopters. Um, Russian helicopters are very interesting, they don't always fly. <laughs> uh, so they're extremely unreliable. Uh, so we, we were trying to get help to him in terms of our Chinook helicopters, other heavy lift stuff, so we could make the make some of this work. There was still water flowing. This was days right after the mudslide. There was still water flowing. It was still raining. And people were just digging themselves out of hillsides, looking for their kids or looking for their parents. Medically, uh, we were really worried about what's very common in these disasters. You guys had an earthquake uh, with a disruption of a lot of, you know, a lot of infrastructure. And although you were, you avoided a lot of stuff, when you start packing homeless people together, you almost always develop problems with upper respiratory infections, dermatitis, uh, and then you get diarrheal diseases. Yeah, you had cholera, but that you fix cholera pretty rapidly by washing your hands and not drinking dirty water. But there, it, and when you get into areas where you guys didn't have mosquitoes and all those nice things, uh, and stuff living in the water, they get, you know, they were getting malaria and dengue and meningitis, encephalitis, because those diseases are all endemic in those countries in, in South America. And the water also had leptospirosis in it, which is an organism that Normally, you can fight off, but if your immune system is down at all, you get nasty sick. So we were worried about what was going to happen to these folks as we went along. So we were looking at, we lost all the potable water, the desal plant, uh, which required, required fixing, and they actually got it going in less than a week. 
but they had no sanitation. All the sewage processing plants were inundated. Everything was contaminated. Uh, people were displaced. Lots of mosquitoes. By, by 10 days, the mosquitoes were out in force. And rats just love this. The, the turnaround of, of vermin and rodents is really very rapid when they sense that there is real food available. You could produce generations in no time. So just looking at it, there, there's, we had a huge outbreak of, of pink eye uh, because people were just, you know, people weren't washing. There was, not, there was no water really to, to clean up in and all. And people were, the initial cases of pink eye got transmitted and touched and went through these homeless areas like mad. So it was a, that's really aggravating. We didn't really see a lot of malaria, dengue, encephalitis anywhere early on. Uh, and the animals, as they got hungry uh, and were going further into the field, were exposed to rabies from rabid, more or less feral animals in the jungle. And, and rabies, there was a small rabies scare uh, about some of the, the regular animals who were so hungry they were biting anything. So critical stuff, we, we knew we wanted to evac people who were hurt, still alive, and find people, of course, if, if they were still alive, uh, and be able to distribute stuff, water, food, you know, shelter, or anything, because this is December. And it, yes, it's close to the equator, but uh, it's, it still was people in purely exposed, uh, and the weather was just terrible. It's still very rainy. Uh, and then worried about that whole problem with food and water and shelter and safety and people wandering around with microphones doing interviews and putting on TV, which which is in the middle of any operation you do. Yeah? If an animal has rabies, yeah. can, can you eat it? No, they don't want to do that. They're, only their brain really contains virus. So it's the, it's the brain of a rabbit animal that you really can't eat. But you'd have to be crazy to eat a rabbit animal. But I, just, I didn't know if they're like cooked out or whatever. Like I didn't know how that rabies works. virus is pretty, it's, it's pretty strong stuff. It will survive a whole lot. But the real concentration is in the front. Rabies is a very interesting disease. I, I never saw a case. It's not very common in this country. I never saw a case until I went to the Middle East. and They had a ward of people dying of rabies. So, wow. Turns out camels transmit rabies <laughs> and other things. The camels are the largest source of death in infants in Egypt. It's higher than diarrhea and pneumonia because camels like to come up to small children and crush their skulls. <laughs> like them crush them. That seems to be a sport for camels. <laughs> I, I have only mean to Yeah. So it's pretty you don't have to sell keep any baby away from the camel. Because they can't get rabies. No, squirrels don't. Squirrels, squirrels are fine. I, and, and, and woodchucks. All the way. Lego morphs like rabbits. These chucks and things are there have been reported cases. Because I, I took care of a man in the emergency department. I, I took care of a man who came in with fever and stiff neck and feeling a little bad and a paper bag. And the paper bag contained a woodchuck that he had tried to give mouth to mouth respiration to as it was seizing and dying. <laughs> and he gave mouth to mouth <laughs> respiration <laughs> to it. Instacart. And four That's days later, he was febrile and shaking and feeling very stiff and wondered if he had rabies. That's just <laughs> well, it well, came to it, a logical conclusion so afterwards. I hope you didn't do that again. It was so cool. It was so cool. I just... He, was he okay? I called him Chuck. What? Was he okay? <laughs> 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 seemed okay. But I, he, we had to, we, we had to send off the, you know, send off this dead smelly woodchuck to the state and had it Autopsy, but it takes days, so we actually started him on rabies because he was, he was he was feeling nasty and stiff neck and the whole thing. And there's no definitive test before you die of, of rabies. So <laughs> we, we had to start treating this guy with rabies vaccine, and, they, and then the chuck turned out to be negative, like you should have. But you can't you can't take what you if you let rabies go for more than seven days, you're dead. You are dead if you have it. You can't fix it. It's, you're just dead. You just say hi. <laughs> and it's a, it's a very terrible way to go. You just seize. If any noise in the room starts seizures. Actually, you can just blow air in your face and it seize. 
So don't give them to this guy. So don't give mouth to mouth to a woodchuck. <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't anyone?